L'shem, L'shem, Yehold Kuchar Behold Shkinta. Welcome to L'shem. Where we're starting Yehold Borer, Yehold Shabbat. Hopefully, we're not just going to do this on tonight. We're also going to do this on Shabbat too. First part. Yeah. And the reason I'm doing this, sometimes in our Bet Knesset we learn about such lofty things, and we forget sometimes the pshat. You know. So this shiur is just. As a reminder, I'm not trying to teach anybody or give anybody Hidushim. This is a certain reminder, and many people, uh, you will watch this, you won't watch it. They asked to learn Hilchot Borer. So here we are learning Hilchot Borer. What's Borer, Abotai? Selecting. Okay, Se- not separating. <coughs> selecting. What does selecting mean? When you have something that grows from the ground. Okay? At least that's the way most Rishonim understand it. And before I gotta teach you guys halacha, I gotta give you one small introduction in halacha. I mean, this is like the ABC of halacha. Moshe got the Torah from Mount Sinai. He gave it to Yehoshua. Yehoshua gave it to the Zikanim. Zikanim gave it to the Nevi'im. Nevi'im gave it to the Ansheik Nesed, Hagdola. And the Torah spread to the Tanaim. Tanaim is second Beit HaMikdash. Tanaim gave it to who? Amoraim. Time of the Gemara. Amoraim passed down the Torah to the Rabbanan Sevorae and the Geonim. That's the time where Muhammad comes into power. Rabbanan Sevorae and the Geonim passed it on to the Rishonim. Rishonim are the first rabbis. We're talking from about the year 1000 to roughly 1500. The way the world counts. Okay, it's like about a 500 year period, maybe a bit longer. The Rishonim are the basis of all halacha. <coughs> Till the year 1496, which was the Spanish Inquisition, the center of Torah was Bavel in Spain. And obviously the Torah then spread into Germany and France. But all Torah was mostly originated in Spain as we call the golden age of Spain, right? And in Bavel. When the Torah died out in Bavel because of the, because of the Almohadans, the fanatical Muslims, the Torah had to spread to the four corners of the world. So God made a miracle. It, it sounded like something bad, but it was a miracle. Four rabbis went to collect money and they were caught by pirates. These were four giants of the yeshiva because they used to send very big rabbis to collect money. So they would, people would see their chokhmah and give money. There was no Instagram, Telegram, charity, GoFundMe back then. You know, you had to actually go out and collect the money. So they went, they got caught by pirates. The pirates kidnapped them, took them to jail, and sold them to four different Torah centers in the world. Africa, Egypt, uh, Italy, and I believe Spain. No, oh, Morocco. From all those four rabbis, Torah was spread to the four corners of the world. One of those rabbis was Rabbeinu Chushiel. Rabbeinu Chushiel. Till today, people name their kids Chushiel. He had a son, Rabbeinu Hananel. Hananel is a very Bukharian name. Hananel. Rabbeinu Hananel had a student called the Reef. Rabbi Yitzchak Alfasi. Yeah. yeah. He was the Reef's Rebbe. The Rif was the first rabbi who codified the Gemara. What does it mean codify the Gemara, Gavriel? He took out all the machloket and he just left the Gemara with the uh, Psak Din. Din. He codified, he made a tamtzi. He says, listen, you don't have time to learn everything. Let's, you know, make it accessible. He was the art scroll of his generation. Obviously, the Rif is not just an art scroll. The Rif is... All right, everybody say? So, the reef caused a revolution in the halachic world. The reef caused halacha to be more accessible now. Because nobody had the time to learn that the rabbis are arguing in the Gemara, uh, Gabriel. Who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. The reef made it accessible now. Correct? The reef had a student. This student... 
The Reef said if he was in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, these are his words, he would have been Moshe Rabbeinu. The Ravad? Huh? What? The Ravad? The Ravad? Oh, the Ravad comes a little later. He's France. The Ravad was French. By the way, French is not really Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi is Germany. We're going to talk about them in a second. <laughs> so, the Reef, that Rabbi was called the Rimigash. The Rimigash. He was, by the way, Ziaraila. You guys asked rabbis who were in Adam Arishon. The, 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 we're going to learn in the chapter 36. Rimi Gash was one of them. He was very big. His, his student was a rabbi called Rabbeinu Maimon. You guys might have heard of his name Rambam. as the Rambam's father. Rabbeinu Maimon, the Rambam's father, was a giant in Torah. He was a Dayan of Cordova. Rabbeinu Maimon, when, he, when the Rambam was nine years old, you know that story that everybody says about the Rambam, he was a kid, his father threw him out of the house and everything? Total nonsense and I don't want to say. When the Rambam was nine years old, his father, Rabbi Maimon, took him inside to see the Rimi Gash, his Rebbe. He was on his deathbed. He took his two hands, he put it on the young Moshe's head and he blessed him. He should be like Moshe Rabbeinu. I don't know what he said. The Rambam said, from that blessing, I got all the powers in my life. This little boy grew up to be who? Rabbeinu Moshe ben Maimon. The Rambam. So we see the, the, the direct transmission of Torah, right? Rav Hai Gaon, the last of the Geonim, taught who? Rabbeinu Hushiel. Rabbeinu Hushiel taught Rabbeinu Hananel. Rabbeinu Hananel taught the Rif. The Rif taught Rimi Gash. Rimi Gash taught Rabbeinu Maimon. Rabbeinu Maimon taught who? The Rambam. The Rambam was the first rabbi, Aaron. He didn't just codify the Gemara. He literally put it in Hebrew. That way any knucklehead that wants to look up, not only did he codify the Gemara, so the Gemara is all over the place, right? He actually took the Gemara and he put it in his own categories. He changed the whole order to make it sense, make sense out of it. Because he did that in his lifetime, he was called a kofer. He was called the changer of Jewish tradition. They basically blasted the guy out of the in many of his personal letters to his students, he, he's literally complaining about his life. He was mocked. His books were burnt. He was known as a heretic. He went back to Egypt, right? He, went, he, was, he was in Egypt. He, he passed away at a young age of 65. 69. Slicha. Stress. Stress. Yeah, stress is a killer. He died. He, died he, he didn't have a good life. His brother died when he was young. He was forced to be the doctor of the sultan. He, if, if you would hear his lifetime... He, from one country to another, from one country to another. Where? How did he have time to write the... No, but he was the first person to codify the Gemara. And Rambam is known to be the master of Halakha. He's the master of Halakha. Hands down. Nobody disagree. He's the king of Halakha. These are all Rishonim, guys. I'm not talking about Akram. This is, this is all t till 1496. From like 1100 till 1496. During this time... A young bud was sprouting in France. His name was Shlomo Yitzchaki. Shlomo ben Yitzchak. We know him as the great luminary of the Jewish people. Rashi. Rashi. Rashi was the student. He was French. Not Ashkenazi. Don't make that mistake. He's French. Sarfati. He, 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 they're closer to Sephardic than they were to Germain. German schools. Rashi, the young Rashi, was a student of Rabbi Yaakov Bar Yakar. And he was a student of, I believe, the Ra'avia, who was a student of Rabbeinu Gershom. You guys know Rabbeinu Gershom. He was the rabbi who said you can't marry more than one wife and you can't force a woman to get a, a divorce document. But don't forget, he only said till the end of the year 5000. Really? Yeah, whoever made whoever took his harem and bumped it out of the out of the you know thing was the Ashkenazi rabbi. Says one day maybe we'll talk about it. He was not responsible for the harem being till today. He came up with the idea, but he he, he didn't mean for it to go this far. Rabbeinu Gershom, guess what? He was a student of who? Rav Hai Gaon from Bavel. Okay, Rav Hai Gaon, Rav Shira Gaon. So you see the Torah is coming still from Iraq, from Babel, right? Just one went to Spain, one went to 
to Germany. Okay? So Rabbeinu Gershom taught the Ra'aviya, who taught the Yaakov Yakar, who taught Rashi. Rashi had the idea not to codify the Gemara. He was not interested in bringing Pesach. He was interested in making the Gemara understandable without cutting anything off. Perush. Perush. He, was, he just wanted to be a commentary. Everyone could learn Gemara and he was very successful. He had three daughters. From his three daughters, two of them had sons. One of them had three sons. The Rivam, Rabbeinu Tam, and the third one is the Rashbam. These were known as the three Tosafists, the Baalei HaTosafot. These three brothers, see brothers, they blew up the Torah in, 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 in uh, France. They literally took it to the next level. They had so many students, their Torah was like a, a fountain that couldn't be stopped. They started the Northern Fran French schools. At the same time, the Northern French schools, in the provincial France, Southern France, a new school was being started of Torah, more closer to Spain, because they're right next to each other. Over there, the great rabbi was known as the Rambam's. Rambam. Ba, the, the Ramban was from there too, but who's the Rambam's Bar Plukta? The Ravid, the Ravad, who the Arya Kadosh says that he used to see Eliyahu and Avi on a daily basis. It's the Ravad. But unfortunately, Halacha doesn't... Unfortunately. He was the first one to say to the Rambam, uh, Hello, Halacha doesn't work like that. You can't just write Halachot. Where did you get this from? And he wrote a book uh, bashing the Rambam. Halacha, not himself. That's the Halacha part. Right and left. These are called Hasagot Ravad. His name was Avraham Ben David. He used to see Eliyahu and Ari. Of the who? You're lying. Yeah. Today or tonight? Today. It was past today. Ah, I think it still counts, no? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in the world it's still daytime? You tell me, Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in the world, because then it would be Torah Lishma. It's crazy. You know, the Ravad, when I was learning, when I learned Halacha, Ravad for me is, uh, I really like the Ravad. Uh, so basically, the Ravad, he was, and he also started his own school. Obviously, the Ramban, Nachmanides, and Rabbeinu Yonah came from those schools. Okay, then eventually they moved to Spain. So these rabbis were the first rabbis to take the Gemara and make it accessible. Okay? The Rambam revolutionized it and he turned Halacha into what? Like Hebrew. He just made it into Hebrew. Simple. 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 And then Spain came to an end. Spanish Inquisition. The minds became stupider. I was about to say rabbis that we can't even fit in their back pocket. But uh, Torah became smaller. Why? When Jews go into Galut, when there's a big change in Judaism, eras end. Eras end. If in a hundred years Mashiach doesn't come, I will, I, I will be thinking that the Holocaust will probably be known as the end of the era of the Achronim. And our era will probably be known as Achrone Achronim. If in another hundred years Mashiach still doesn't come. Because till the Holocaust time, the mines, the Gironim of Ashkenaz and Bavel, you know, they were huge. And then suddenly the Holocaust came and suddenly everything became, you know, even smaller. There was a young boy who was running away from the, from the Kritmachs. Those, our cousins with the cross. And his name was Yosef. Okay? The young Yosef. He will one day be known as the one and only Baal Shulchan Aruch. This boy grew up to be without a father, without a mother. He grew up in his uncle's house, gone from one yeshiva to another. Very humble, very humble. Never ever put anybody down. In his books, he's the most, he was chosen to write the Shulchan Aruch only because he was respectful the way he talked to other rabbis. Very respectful. Never tried to put himself above anyone. He was chosen to codify the halacha even more codify it, to, to, to make a codex out of it, and he created a book even more simpler than a Rambam called the Shulchan Aruch. Huh? Rav yeah. Yosef Karo. The set table. The set table. Yeah, right. It means, it means there's nothing after. I mean, you can't get 
I mean, you, you can't get simpler than that, but obviously we can. Obviously we can. And obviously the Shulchan Aru, the Rabbi Sakara had students. And those students had students. You know, his students were the Geonim, the Maharitats, and many, many other. He had 700 Talmudim in his yeshiva. He had the biggest yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. And his students had students. Till, obviously, the great rabbis of Iraq, of Syria. All of them are students of the students of Rabbi Yosef Karo. And obviously, in our generation, we had a rabbi who came and took the Shulchan Aruch and all the things, and he he made it even more compressed. As known, he was the great luminary of our generation, Rabbi Avadia Yosef, who passed away four years ago. And he codified the Torah even more. And he put it all in a set of books called Hazon Avadia. So my whole point of telling you all you guys this just to give you a small insight of how the Torah was went down from generation to generation to generation, 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 generation until me and you are sitting over here and one day our kids are going to say hopefully me and you are also one part of the chain. No, I'm sorry. You have to be part of the chain. Okay? So we're going to learn about Borer. As we know, there's a famous saying everybody keeps Shabbat by mistake these days. You, keep, you think you're keeping Shabbat. One of the easiest halachot in Shabbat and probably one of them that, that easily uh, it's broken is borer. Borer is selecting. I huh? I have, I have, I still have here. I find it the hardest. <laughs> there are many things in borer that you think you're doing wrong, which you're really doing right, and maybe something that you think you're doing right, but you're doing wrong. As many cases in halacha. So first thing, one who's borer. How would they do borer inside the Mishkan, by the way? When they would select, when stuff would go from the ground, uh, I don't know, wheat or anything they needed to use to, to, uh, to sow something, you know, that grows from the ground, I don't know, cotton or whatever the case was, they would take a sieve, you know what a sieve is? It's like a big uh, circular thing, a napa, yeah, they would, they, or they would throw it up in the air and then it would... And it would, it would separate by, you know what I'm saying? That's borer. It would select the good from the bad. It would separate the bad from the good. Now, we always think in borer, when is it borer, guys? When I'm taking the bad from the good, right? Also taking the good from the bad is borer. If you're not going to eat that thing right away. Okay? When are you allowed to take the good from the bad? On condition that I eat it right away. 30 minutes. Well, okay, no. That's 30 minutes only on condition that you're serving a very big amount of people. Okay? But if you're something for yourself right now, you have to do it right away. You can't do it. I'm saving it. And we're going to learn. Don't worry. Let's not jump. Okay? So let's learn first. Haborer ochel mitof psole. The one who selects good from bad, the good food from the bad food. Kedele echol altar. Because he has to eat that food right away. La altar means right away. Later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> altar later. imu borer al kaf umazleg. Even if you selecting the good from the bad with a fork or a spoon, it means not with your hands. Mutar. Extension. You're allowed. Why? It's an extension of your body. Your fork and a spoon. For example, if you're eating a wet vegetable with a fork and spoon. Do you still have to wash your hands? No. Yes. Why? The fork and the spoon is an extension of your body, says Rabbi Wadia. Okay? What? Muta, just like, just like over here in Borer. In Borer, even, so he says, even though you might think, okay, when can I select the good from the bad? The good food from the bad food? Only if I do it with my hands. Or with a vessel, it's Asur. No. Even with a fork and a spoon, it's okay. Okay? Let's say I take the good from the bad with a sieve. A sieve. A vessel that's used to select. But I'm taking the good from the bad. In that case, it's Asur. Why? In that case, it's not allowed. Because it, that vessel is made to select Gavriel. But a fork and a spoon was not created to select the good from the bad. So therefore, if I select, if I'm borer, 
ochel, good, from bad, psoret, with a fork and a spoon to eat it right away, mutar. It's allowed, it's permissible. Hilchach mutar livror vayem omit opsoret lecho laltar. Once again, the only condition is if you're going to eat it right away. So let's give a small, let's, let's, let's go back for one minute. If I have a food, you know, food, a uh, salat, has tomatoes, vegetables, onions. Can I take out the onions? I hate onions. I hate tomatoes. Could you take out the onions? That's for sure not a lot. Can I take out the cucumbers? Yes. I just want to eat the cucumbers. Can I do that? Yes. Only on one condition. If you're going to eat it right now. You take whatever you want, not whatever you don't want. What? You take whatever you want, not whatever you don't want. Yeah, whatever you want. That's called okhir. That's the good. Okay? But you have to do it right away. I mean, samukh, close to your suda. And you could even do it with a fork can you do it or a spoon. Plate? Huh? Can you do it on your plate? With okhir mitokha psole? Yeah. yeah, even if you separate bad from the good, we're going to learn if it's in the same plate, it's okay. Okay. I'm going to learn that. Okay? We're, 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 so we're, we're jumping, guys. I'm sorry. We're still, you know, relax. Okay. Now, even if the bad, the stuff you don't want to eat, is, is like 70%. There's 70% onions over there. And only 30% cucumbers. Whether the food, the one that you like, the cucumber is a 70% over the 30% of onions. You still got to separate the good from the bad. Not the bad from the good. So what is he trying to teach us over here? Size doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's what makes the more the most of the mixture. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. Guys, when you're doing borer on Shabbat and you're separating the bad from the good, you're doing a isur de oraita. It's a prohibition from the Torah. I'm eating it right away though. I'm separating the bad from the good to eat it right away. I don't want the onions. I want to eat the cucumbers right now, right away. Even if you're doing it right now to eat it, it's asur from the Torah. It's just as bad as putting on a fire on Shabbat. Okay? Now, you have a cluster of grapes. There are, you know, sometimes on the cluster of grapes, there's the bad grapes, you know, the kushtidegi as they say. Pussy diggy. Pussy diggy. And then there is the good grapes. Now you might think I could take out the bad grapes. Why? Maybe it's not considered a mixture. Right? Why you might think that? Same item. It's the same item, but they're all on different Branch. branches. So Ravavadia says, Eshkola Navim, a cluster of grapes. There is bad grapes and there is good grapes. You're not allowed to pluck out the bad grapes. Even though they're all on different branches, it's still considered one item. One item. Very good. Next halakha. They gave you chicken, pieces of chicken mixed with rice. Oh, Oshpalov is the beautiful example. There's carrots with rice. And you hate carrots. You just want to eat the plof. You want to eat the rice, not the carrots. The, what is considered the good, what's considered the bad? The ochel, the food, is considered what? The rice. the rice, because I just want the rice. And the thing that you don't want to eat, even though I want to eat it later. Carrots. I want to eat the carrots later. But I don't want to eat it right now. Right now it's considered psolet. It's considered bad. Yeah, not eatable. It's, you don't want to eat it even right now, you're going to eat it later. So you have to separate, if you want to separate, you have to separate the rice. If you want to take out, you can't take out that carrot, <coughs> right? You got to just take out the rice. However, let's say in your plate, they give you chicken and rice. It's chicken and rice, and it's not mixed together, the chicken and the rice. It's not considered borer if you take out the chicken or the rice. Why? It's not one mixture. It has to be... Together, has to be mu'urav. What's mu'urav? A mixture. Very nice. Now, what does that mean that you I have to eat it right away? 
It's only mutar to do borer if I eat it, we said, right away. It's the good from the bad, not the bad from the good, don't forget. What does that mean? It has to be very close to the si'uda. That means your wife is preparing the table and she wants to separate for you the good from the bad. You're coming home from work, from, uh, from, from shul. She can't do it at 10 o'clock if you're only coming home at 12. She has to do it right before you come home. However, if there's many people in your coming to your, I have a lot of guests, and you want to, you know, you want to save time, you're allowed to do it within half an hour, as you were saying, Ariel, within half an hour of your husband and the guests coming home. Okay? Sounds good? They're only coming home when they, before starting eating. Ah, that's true too. Very good. They're very good. So by the Bukharians, even if they come home, it takes them an hour and a half to sit on the table. So she has to put that into account. Uh, now, let's say I have guests. I don't eat salad. I hate salad. No, for real. You ever, see, you ever see me eat salad? No, I don't eat salads. But your guests, they like salads. And some guests like this kind of salad, this kind of salad. Can I do borer for them? Within half an hour of the thing, the good from the bad. Not bad from the good. You understand? Can I do borer for them, even though I myself don't want to eat it? I'm talking the borer in the right way, not in the bad way, obviously. But I'm doing it for them, even though I'm not eating from it. Do I have to partake in the actual meal to do it for them? Or do, do I not have to partake from the actual meal? It matters what they feel. Correct. It matters what you're doing for them. Even though you're not actually partaking in the salad and you're taking the good for the bad for them within half an hour of the meal, even though you're not actually partaking it for it, it's okay. Yes. Now, here's an interesting halakha. Let's say you have a lot of guests coming home and you gotta prepare a lot of food. Could you do borer, the good from the bad? For example, but you want to do it in a big amount, even though you only need ten percent of that. You want to do ten times the amount. You know, you know, seri puri, just in case. You know what I'm saying? Or could you only do the amount that's needed for your guests? Or could you do, you know, how they say harama, like a trickery way? Wait. If you already do it, might as well just do it. Yeah, exactly. No, the halacha is. You have guests in your Shabbat Chatan, Kayotzebo. Lo yivror le orchim ochel mitok. So you can't select the good from the bad. Ela kishiur achilato le altar. Only the amount that they need. There's no harama over here. You can't, you know, cheat the system. Okay? Uh, let's do one more halacha. We'll call it a night. Let's say you have an animal. An animal, and let's say the, the, the cat food or the dog food has two kinds of food mixed inside. You know your dog or your cat doesn't like to eat both parts of that food. So you just scoop out the part that they like. But you're doing it for the animal. We have fish food. And the fish food is a couple of worms and stuff. You just, and they, you know your fish, they don't like to eat all of it. So you want to just take out the good for the animal. Not for the guests, not for you. But for the animal, is that allowed to do on Shabbat? The halakha is, even if you're doing it for your animal, mutar, good from bad, it's allowed. Even for the animal, it's allowed. But some say that some people are going to be like, what the heck is this guy doing? It might be married ayin. It's better to do it with sina'a. When no one's looking. Uh, let's end over here. Baruch Amen. Amen. Amen.